And this brings us now to the 29th study at the British Columbian Camp 1983. This is Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock. We come right back now to a continuation of the study of um, the story of the cleansing of the temple, a story, of course, of unrighteous or unholy people in direct confrontation with a holy person, namely, of course, the person Jesus Christ on the one side versus the assembled changes of money, priests and money makers on the other side. <clears throat> and it's not very hard to see, of course, where the real power lay in this particular little drama. Now, on page 161... We find that um, that in the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entering upon his work. We've already seen, of course, that the actions of Christ were highly symbolic. That uh, what he said was quite uh, impressive and quite important, but in addition to that, what he did was also a message. We recognise that, of course, in the making of the wine, of the water into wine at the marriage feast in Canaan. And we now find that, likewise, the cleansing of the temple was a highly symbolic action on the part of Jesus. In fact, he had very little to say in the whole drama. He simply said, Take these things, hence must you make my father's house and house of merchandise. That's all he said. So there wasn't very much spoken, not very much declared, but, but a tremendous amount demonstrated or manifested in this, in this experience. Now, <clears throat> the mission of Christ is to restore holiness in the world, to bring back everlasting righteousness in the place of, of sin and iniquity. His mission is to make an end of sins, as we read back in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel. And the cleansing of the temple was a demonstration of that intention. <clears throat> Let's read now some of this paragraph to get that message plain and, plainly and clearly page 161 in the book Desire of Ages in the cleansing of the temple Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah entering upon his work that temple erected for the abode of the divine presence was designed to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world from eternal ages it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy seraph to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the Creator. Because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of a divine one. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity, and through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul, but the Jews had not understood the, signif the significance of the building that it gave us so much pride. They did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. The word, word yield, of course, means submit. It also means obedience. Now, just the, the very briefest review of what we looked at before, and that is this, that God designed that temple with his two apartments to be an object lesson for Israel and for the world. In other words, God designed that they should see that building as a model or a picture of what they themselves were to be. And we could mention many points in this regard. For instance, there was the table of showbread symbolizing the fact that the Christian feeds upon the word of God day by day. The altar of incense to indicate that our prayers got mingled with the incense of Christ's righteousness. The seven brains golden candlestick to symbolize the light which shines from the illumination or the oil of the Holy Spirit. And the innermost apartment, of course, the law written upon the very, in the very heart of man as a divine living principle. And around the whole building, the atmosphere of peace and many, many more lessons, of course, we could pick up and, and turn to, such as the gold on the inside symbolizing the inner adorning, symbolizing that um, the gold of character or justification by faith is within and as, as a heart experience and not as an, eternal, as, as an external glitter. Now, while the Israelites kept their eyes turned upon that building as the model of what they were to be and day by day faithfully sought to achieve the model they exhibited, that building remained a pure, un 
modified, unchanged representation of what they were to be. But the moment that they began to look in other directions more and more until finally they're looking in the opposite direction to worldly temples of Baal and they made the temple of Baal to be their model and their, and their, and their pattern then that building actually changed in some respects to become a picture of what they had become. It was now a, a representation of what they were to be, what they had become. And that point is made very plain in the same paragraph as I read directly on from where we left off. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem filled with the tumult of unholy traffic represented all too truly the temple of the heart defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. So that, that sentence tells us, of course, that the temple had become a picture of what those men had themselves come to be because within them was the unholy, noisy traffic of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. <clears throat> in other words, there was in them the spirit of disobedience and the disobedient, of course, can never be holy people, can they? Because that is not a qualification for holiness, disobedience. Now when Jesus Christ drove out all those people, then Sister Wise says, in cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission, his mission to cleanse the heart from the fallen of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lusts, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. You know, I, I always marvel, with all my heart and soul, I marvel at the, uh, the way in which the world today is blind to the very simple, clear work of the gospel of righteousness. Again and again and again we find such direct statements as he drove them out. We don't find, for instance, Christ saying to those buyers and sellers, now look, from now on I'm in charge here, I've re-entered my temple, I'm the voice of authority, and all you fellows now will do as I say. So you over there, now, you now can be quiet over there and you be quiet over here and you do as you're told over here. That wasn't what Christ did, did he? He drove them out until not one person was left in the assembly. Not one. And the only way to establish righteousness is to drive out the spirit of disobedience and replace that with the spirit of obedience. Right? There's no other way but that. Now when you think of other statements, I think particularly one in connection with the sanctuary found in Zechariah the third chapter, where Joshua the high priest stood clothed how? In filthy garments before the angel of the Lord who is Jesus Christ in person and Satan stood there to resist him at that point of time. Now Joshua's faith penetrated to the most holy place or right through to the angel of the covenant and the command was given take away the filthy garments from him and clothe him with change of raiments. And those words, of course, couldn't be clearer and there's only one possible interpretation of them. The filthy garments, by the way, symbolise our iniquity because the Lord said in that same chapter, Zechariah, the third chapter, he said, um, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from you, to go away from you. A little while ago, down in Australia, the Australasian Record, which is the Seventh Adventist Church's official publication, published an issue in which they um, printed the, the chapter from Volume 5 called Joshua and the Angel. And this little magazine has three columns across the page. And right in the middle of the page, there was a picture, just right in there like that, where the X is. Now, on the left-hand side, just above the picture, in the first column, there, there were the words, take away the filthy garments from him and clothe him with change of raiment. And the words were repeated, I think, also in the last column, about, roughly about the same position, a little bit higher, I think it was. And at least three times on that page, the words were repeated, take away the filthy garments from him and clothe him with change of raiment. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and, um, and he was clothed in righteousness. Now what kind of picture would you expect to see in the middle of the page illustrating the thought, take away the filthy garments from him and give him a change of raiment? What sort of picture would you expect to find? A man being totally stripped of all his dirty clothes, right? And over, those dirt, and, and over his now washed and clean body, a new set of clothes altogether. I expect to find a person 
then a picture for instance of a person now clothed in spotless garments and lying in the smelly heap to one side the old garments which have been stripped from him before the new ones were placed upon him now isn't that the kind of picture that would illustrate those words yeah. right so is that what you thought do you think that was what was there no it wasn't the incredible thing was that that was a picture of Jesus Christ wrapping a beautiful white robe over the man still dressed in the dirty rags the smelly stinking dirty rags now what kind of blindness possesses a church or an artist when they will put that kind of picture there to illustrate that kind of text and the two are side by side it uh, is a blindness which is really incredible isn't it and that blindness remains when you consider of course the very very plain text of scripture such as Ezekiel 36 26 I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh I'll give you a heart of flesh the thorn bush picture where we're told that the thorn bush is torn up by the roots and replaced by the new tree the picture here of course in uh, the temple where Jesus drove out the money changers the lenders the buyers and the sellers and put his own quiet presence in the place of them and 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 where the Lord says if any man be in Christ he is a new creature or a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new and so in picture after picture after picture we find that the only provision God makes of course is for the eradication of the old before the implantation of the new that's the only kind of picture that God uh, has in mind and when you think about it of course it is a picture consistent with man's own practices because if a person if for instance a mother is uh, greeted by her child running in from uh, outside there's been rain and there's been all kinds of mud and the child is now his clothes are, clothes are dirty and they're wet and cold does she go to the closet and take out his best Sabbath coat and wrap it around the dirty clothes what mother would do that none and in the garden what man would plant an apple tree beside the thorn bush an apple tree beside a great big mature thorn bush no one would do that they would root the thorn bush out and plant the new seed beside it and so we find that in man's own practices and dealing with that same kind of problem he doesn't do what he teaches in his theology of course some folks say well what about the prodigal son now when the prodigal son came back from the um, long sojourn in Egypt you don't quite read it in the Bible as clearly as you do in the book Christ Object Lessons that as the son returns from afar off the father takes off his own beautiful coat and puts that over the dirty garment of the young man let me just find the place here in the book Christ Object Lessons and we'll uh, read the actual words of it where Sister White tells us this is what the uh, father did when the son returned again from a far distant place um, right it's on page 203 in Christ Object Lessons it says that while he's yet a great way off the father discerns his form love is of quick sight not even the deg degradation of the years of sin can conceal the son from the father's eyes he had compassion and ran and fell upon his neck in a long clean tender embrace the father will permit no contemptuous eye to mock at his son's misery and tatters he takes from his own shoulders the broad rich mantle and wraps it around the son's wasted form and the youth sobs at his repentance saying father I have sinned etc now do we find any indication there that the son is stripped first and then clad none at all at that point he is, his sinfulness is covered or his dirty garments are covered by the father's rich robe and there is a place for that we need to recognize that point very plainly and clearly it is when the father brings the boy to his house and he now becomes a member of the home again that at that point he says to his servants strip this young boy and put on him the best garments in the house now when we go back for instance to the Passover service we find that the same principle is very plainly taught there there are six steps altogether number one was the circumcision number two they chose the lamb number three they killed the lamb number four they sprinkled the blood number five they ate the flesh and number six they then the firstborn of Egypt was killed now when we come to the fourth point where they sp sprinkled the blood upon the door 
here's that blood on the door now when that was done the people inside that room were still what they were still slaves of the king of Egypt right they had not yet gained their freedom and therefore they were not yet under God's personal direction and charge they had not yet eaten of the lamb and therefore they were not yet born again Christians in the antitype now when the angel of death went by the covering of blood over people who are still bond slaves to Egypt saved those folk from suffering the penalty, of, the penalty of death and kept them alive until such time as they could experience their freedom now despite the wickedness which is rampant in the world today because of the presence of God's people in the world the covering of Christ's righteousness covers the sinfulness of humanity is that right? And, and will do so until such time as they either reject the mercy of God completely and die for the, in their sins or recognizing God's wondrous grace and wondrous love they yield to God's entreaties and appeals and become truly transformed men and women so in the, in the Passover service and the prodigal son story we find the same picture being repeated with the prodigal son we find that first of all out here where the father and the son meet the father then put, puts the robe of righteousness around his son cover, covering up his dirty garments until they come to the house and when they reach the house then the, the father says now take the dirty garments off him and give him a change of raiment so, when, when, so then the sprinkling of the blood upon the door and the putting of the garment over the dirty one here in the case of the prodigal son does not at that point of time represent new birth but rather the covering of protection which precedes that and keeps us alive through Romans 7 until we do come to the new birth experience but in the story of Zechariah and the angel there was the, the, the specific uh, command take away the filthy garments give him a cloth or a change of raiment and um, that text of course was supposed to be illustrated by that picture but the picture told a very different story altogether which means that the, the artist ignored what the text was saying and put his own ideas in or a truth in the wrong place which made that truth to be very much an error so it is then that when we look at this temple cleansing we ask ourselves how could anyone miss the point that the establishment of holiness in the very work of Jesus Christ what Christ came to do what his mission was was to root out the unrighteousness the unholy spirit to take away the spirit of disobedience and replace this with righteousness with holiness which of course is the spirit of dis the spirit of obedience and the spirit of faith and the picture of course could not be more plainly and clearly brought to view than it is in this case now, of course many people um, just simply don't believe the word of God and they have their own set ideas as to how God will save us and no amount of plain scriptures will ever change their minds I'll never forget the time when back in 1960 the college president in New Zealand said to me I don't know what those scriptures mean he said to me about victory over sin but this much I do know they just don't mean what they say and that's the exact words he said at that point of time and when the leading theologian in the Australasian division has to say that in order to defend his rejection of God's truth then he doesn't have much of an argument does he because if the word of God does mean what it says what's the use of it it's, it's, a, it's a book of deception that is not a guiding directive to God's people at any time in human history now <clears throat> then it's quoted again on page 161 Malachi 3 1-3 which quotes the work of Jesus Christ as, as the, as the uh, refiner and purifier of silver and then there's, then, there's, then there's more in the next paragraph, paragraph about the personal application to the um, removal of sin from our lives now we come back to we come on to page 162 and um, we return now to the story of those who had been terrified and had fled, fled from the temple in their terror from the presence of Jesus Christ and bear in mind of course that what we're looking at now is a contrasting picture between the holy in the person of Jesus and the unholy in the person of these priests and rulers these buyers and sellers and of course the difference between their purity and impurity their righteousness and their unrighteousness their weakness and their power is made very very clear in the attitude that the two maintain one toward the other so I'll read just a little further now overpowered with terror 
the priests and rulers had fled from the temple court and from the searching glance had read their hearts. In their flight they met others on, on their way to the temple and bade them turn back, telling them what they had seen and heard. Christ looked upon the fleeing men with yearning pity for their fear and their ignorance of what constituted true worship. In this scene he, was, he saw symbolised the dispersed of the whole Jewish nation for their wickedness and impenitence. And why did the priests flee from the temple? Why did they not stand their ground? He who commanded them to go as a carpenter's son, a poor Galilean without earthly rank or power. Why did they not resist him? Why did they leave the game so ill acquired and flee at the command of one whose outward appearance was so humble? That's the question. And the answer is found in the next paragraph. Christ spoke with the authority of a king, and in his appearance and in the tones of his voice there was that which they had no power to resist. At the word of command they realised, as they had never realised before, their true position as hypocrites and robbers. When divinity flashed to humanity, not only did they see indignation in Christ's countenance, but they realised the import of his words. They felt as if before the throne of the eternal judge with their sentence passed on them for time and for eternity. For a time they were convinced that Christ was a prophet and many believed him to be the Messiah. The Holy Spirit flashed into their minds the utterances of the prophets concerning Christ. Would they yield to this conviction? Now we'll come back again to the question as to why these men fled from the presence of Jesus Christ. And... Um, <clears throat> We'll now approach the, the very interesting element of um, the way in which God accomplishes his work. Now we read yesterday, for instance, that God placed a fear upon the Shechemites so that they didn't dare touch uh, Jacob and his sons, even though these men, or Jacob's sons in particular, of course, had done things which merited a return service of revenge and uh, destruction. Now here we find Jesus Christ having the power to drive those men out of the temple without touching any of them, without actually pushing them or forcing them or even threatening them for that matter because we, we can't say that the cords in Christ's hand was actually a threat because he never ever indicated he would actually whip them with it. Rather, as I said before, the fact that he held that scourge in his hands and kept it under his control was a guarantee that while it was under his control it would not whip anybody because God does not use compelling power or force to execute his commands. And yet, despite the fact that Christ did not use force, he had no army, army at his command, there were no soldiers obeying his orders, yet he was able to absolutely drive out those folk to the very, very last person. Now interestingly enough, there are two classes of people, as we shall learn later, who were not terrorised by Christ or terrified before him, and they were the sick, the needy, the poor, the halt, the, blame, the, the lame and the blind. They remained behind. And there was another very interested observer at that time whose name was Nicodemus. He was present there and saw the whole thing. Proof of that is found in the very next chapter, which deals with the experience of Nicodemus which we'll be looking at, of course, um, a little later. And if I can just find the place quickly. Um, I, can find it. I read it just the other day. Let me see if I can find it again now. Um, it, should be in, it should be on page 167. Just don't see it quickly right now, but I remember it the other day, and it plainly says that Nicodemus was was present and an observer at the. Um, yes, it's on page 168 and the first main paragraph. Since hearing Jesus, Nicodemus had anxiously studied the prophecies relating to the Messiah, and the more he searched, the stronger was his conviction that this was the one who was to come. With many others in Israel, he had been greatly distressed by the profanation of the temple. He was a witness of the scene when Jesus drove out the buyers and the sellers. He beheld the wonderful manifestation of divine power. He saw the Saviour receiving the poor and healing the sick. He saw their looks of joy and heard their words of praise. And he could not doubt that Jesus of Nazareth was the scent of God. Not just was sent of God, but was the scent of God. Now Nicodemus didn't run. The poor and, and the sick did not run. 
So what difference was there between those who ran and those who did not run? And the answer, of course, becomes very clear in the fact that the ones who did run were abandoned sinners in whom there was no disposition to repent whatsoever. As on page 162 I read, Repent they would not. Repent they would not. 162, page 162, again. Now, in studying this particular point, we want to understand a little better if possible by what means God is able to drive out the presence of these people without using force. And this, of course, takes us back to the time when Lucifer up in heaven was driven out of heaven itself. Remember the the text, of course, in Revelation 12, which talks about the war up in heaven, where Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and he was cast out. Verse 9 of Revelation 12, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now many folk, of course, have a picture in their mind of uh, Satan being bodily picked up by God and literally tossed out of heaven head over heels, just like uh, some of these, what they call them, uh, in some some places, uh, bounces. bounces, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> bounces take a person by the, by, the, by the back of the collar and the seat of his pants and just throw him out on the pavement, right? <laughs> and that's the picture some folk have of Satan's expulsion from heaven. But inasmuch as Jesus Christ did what the Father did, and inasmuch as the, as the Father's actions are revealed by the actions of Jesus Christ, then would not the, the uh, eradication or the driving out of these buyers and sellers in the temple course be a very clear picture of how God drove Satan out of heaven? Remember the point again that Christ did what the Father did. John chapter 5 tells us that in plain terms. So then, did Jesus Christ get those fellows and by physical force throw them out of the temple? Not at all. He did it by bringing to them a revelation of truth, right? A revelation of truth was imparted to those men. And this, of course, is the righteous way. And the truth imparted to those men was a picture to themselves of themselves. They saw themselves as they really were, And at the same time they saw a picture of Christ's purity and righteousness so that unholiness was given a view of holiness and the unholy found it physically impossible to remain in the presence of the holy. Quite impossible. Instead of staying there in absolute terror they fled from that scene and were found no more in that temple whatsoever. So when Jesus Christ draws nigh what must sin do? It must flee, and it will flee. And let me testify again that uh, Sister Wise says on page 661 in the same book, Desire of Ages, that he who beholds the Saviour's master's love will be purified in heart, elevated in thought, and transformed in character. Right? Now, purification of heart means indicates a cleansing process. In other words, when you behold the Saviour's master's love and reach out and lay hold upon that master's love, and that wonderful love then as a, as a redeeming power comes into your life, it will most certainly drive out the old dispositions, the old sins and errors, and you will find stealing upon you a new nature, a new disposition, a new growth in grace. I'm not talking about uh, the new birth experience, I'm talking about the progressive work of Reformation after we have been born again. And I'm sure that those of you who have spent time beholding the master's charms of Jesus Christ have been have found yourselves growing into a new kind of life altogether. Now, the, the encouraging feature, of course, which as I briefly mentioned toward the end of the last study period, is this, that numerous as those men were, stubborn as they were, unrepentant as they were, they were not able for one moment to resist the power of Christ's holiness and they could not and they did not stay there in his presence they fled from that place and left it completely empty of the, of the presence of their previous clamor and sinfulness 
Now, if Jesus Christ alone and unassisted could do that to that vast, uh, that rather large company of people, where the spirit of those people had, then what's going to happen to your sinfulness if the presence of Christ enters into your soul temple? The same thing, right? And this confirms the truth of the great promises where God says, I will take away the filthy garments, I will give you a change of raiment, I will create you into a new person, I will make you more precious than the, the golden wedge of Ophir, and so on and on and on. That is, the, that this picture assures us of Christ's power to achieve that. Now, <clears throat> holiness, as we saw in the life of John the Baptist, has, has a power to shape and mould and soften a person's life. It changes us more and more into the divine image. And unholiness or unrighteousness also has the power to shape a person into a certain mould or pattern. So day by day, just as a tree becomes confirmed in the shape to which you have moulded it as a little thing, so likewise sin makes a person more and more confirmed in the ways of evil. Now, when, when there is given to those men in the, in the temple courts a revelation of the righteousness of Christ, of the holiness of Christ and the power of Jesus Christ, then what ought that to have done to those buyers and sellers as at the same time they saw their own unrighteousness? Right, it should have convinced them of their need. It, should reveal, it, it did reveal to them their need and it should convince them that there was a great work to be done in them to change them from what they were into something better than what they were. Now those men had minds and they had hearts. Right, now let's look at the minds of those men and also at the hearts of those men and by the hearts of course we mean the spiritual nature of those individuals. Now, first of all, we'll look at the intellect or the mental nature of those men, and then we'll look at the spiritual nature of those men who were there in the temple courts. Now, so far as their minds were concerned, those minds had been trained for a long time in habits of greed, in habits of pride, in habits of cruelty, and, and in short, in habits of selfishness, okay? Now on the spiritual side, which, which side of course was an evil spiritual nature, then they had in them the spirit of disobedience, that's rather long word to write here, but uh, I'll put it in my name. the spirit of disobedience and there was, there was, there was a spirit of greed, pride, cruelty and so forth. In other words, in those men sin reigned supreme so far as their hearts were concerned. However, despite the fact that their minds had been trained in this direction, they still had the kingly power of reason, right? They still had the kingly power of reason. And when, when that picture was put before their minds, they should have sat down and said, all right, now we make, they should have reasoned like this, they should have said, now we make great professions of righteousness and holiness and peace. We make great professions. But today we have been shown in very clear terms how shallow, how empty our profession really is. Because instead of being righteous people, we are sinful, unholy, unrighteous and so forth. And there's no question about the fact that the purity and power in the life of Jesus Christ is a revelation and in that man is something we don't have. Therefore, if we have any sense at all, we ought to sit down and do some, some intellectual reasoning devoid of all emotionalism. We must refuse to consider the, the wellspring of evil in our hearts and the long training of the years and candidly recognize that something's got to be done or we're going to be lost souls and perish eternally. Now, is that the kind of logical reasoning they ought to have indulged in? Or I shouldn't say, you say indulged exactly, but is that the kind of logical reasoning they should have turned to at that point? They should have. But those men were controlled by their evil natures and blinded by their long habits and practices. And as the statement says, repent they would not. They knew that Christ's sympathy for the poor had been aroused. They knew that they had been guilty of extortion in, in their dealings with the people. Because Christ discerned their thoughts, they hated him. 
right? Because Christ discerned, discerned their thoughts, they hated him. They should, have, they should have loved him for doing that because no one can ever start the Christian pathway, no one can start to walk with God unless they first of all get a picture of themselves as they are and see their great need. Remember the other day we looked at the story of the men who came from Capernaum asking Christ to heal his dying son and um, that man came without any realisation of his need. All he saw was the fact that I have a sick boy, he's dying and I want that boy healed. That's all he could say. He did understand, of course, that he came as an unbeliever, that he himself was spiritually dying, that his son was but a picture physically of what he was spiritually. He didn't see that. But when Jesus Christ's words, except you see signs of wonders, laid bare that man's heart and like a flash of light he saw himself as he was, then that man accepted that as a wonderful service of love from Christ to him. And that's, that proved to be, a service of love proved to be um, the beginnings of his outreach for true Christian experience and left Christ's presence in just a few short minutes a, a, a thoroughly converted man with a child back home who, who had been lifted from the very gates of death. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul calls the old tables of stone a ministration of death. But it's a glorious ministration of death, right? It's a glorious ministration of death. Now, when Jesus Christ discerned the thoughts of those men and let them know he read their hearts, when the purity of Christ's presence laid open before them the real picture of themselves, then was that a ministration of death or of condemnation? It certainly was, but was, was it a glorious ministration? It certainly was. It was glorious in this respect that if it, was, if, if it had been received as God planned it should be, then those men would have had the glorious ministry of being led to Jesus Christ to gain a transformation of nature and thus come into harmony with God and have peace with God. But tragically, of course, that which was designed to save them, they used only to sink them deeper into the mire of determined, stubborn resistance of what uh, God had done for them. So I come back now to page 162, and the statement says, His public rebuke was humiliating to their pride, and they, was, and they were jealous of his growing influence with the people. They determined to challenge him as to the power by which he had driven them forth, and who gave him this power. Right? Now, they didn't question the fact that the power was there, did they? That, that, that was beyond question. If they come back and said, well now, uh, do you, are you claiming to have power? Christ would have said, could have said to them, well, what are you talking about? You've experienced that power. It's not a matter of claim, it's a matter of your own personal experience that proves the point that there was power. But they said, well, go back and we'll challenge him as to the power by which he had driven them forth and who gave him this power. And so slowly and thoughtfully, but with hate in their hearts, they returned to the temple. But what a change had taken place during their absence. When they fled, the poor remained behind, and these were now looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me, for this cause came I into the world." Now this, this is um, worthy of no notice at this point because um, the proud and, uh, and rich people of the time viewed Christ's work in a very different light from that of the, uh, of the poor people. Let's go back now to the Red Sea. And we'll find that the pillar of cloud was one thing to the Egyptians and something else altogether to the Israelites. And there's the, was the Red Sea there. And the great host of Israel was encamped here and back here, of course, were, were the uh, multitudes of Pharaoh and his armies with their chariots and so forth. And the pillar of cloud was there between the Israelites and the Egyptians. Now, one side was a glorious cloud of light that shone over all the, all the Israelite encampments, but the other side was a black cloud that darkened the camp of the Egyptians all throughout long and very serious night. And in the book Patriarchs and Prophets is a very, very fine statement in regard to that difference, a statement which I think is well worth our keeping in mind, to demonstrate that what to the wicked is a, um, a message of darkness and despair 
is to God's people the very, very wonderful message of hope and light and blessing. So I turn to um, page 290, Patriarchs and Prophets, and read these words. The cloud which was a wall of darkness to the Egyptians was to the Hebrews a great flood of light, illuminating the whole camp and shedding brightness upon the path before them. So there's, there's the difference. As I said, the cloud which was a wall of darkness to the Egyptians was to the Israelites a great and wonderful light. So, and now comes the very beautiful spiritual application of this, so the dealings of providence bring to the unbelieving darkness and despair, while to the trusting soul they are full of light and peace. The same events, the same dealings of providence, which to one group of people of darkness and despair are to the trusting soul full of light and peace. The path where God leads the way may lead through the desert or the sea, but it is a safe path. That's always been a very inspiring promise to me. The path where God leads the way may lie through the desert or the sea, but it is a safe path. Patriarchs and Proverbs, page 290. And so, the same principle, of course, is made clear in the reception given to Jesus Christ by those on the one hand who were obdurate in their unrighteousness and the poor and the needy on the other hand. Now, when Christ stood in the temple and drove out those money changers, he was a terror to them. He exposed their sinfulness. He was to them a humiliating power, a, a one who condemned their unrighteousness. But nothing of that atmosphere reached the poor and needy who were reaching out <clears throat> after Christ's salvation. And uh, when those money changers fled, of course, the poor and the needy were there. And for the first time, Jesus Christ began to really minister his, his divine power in miracle after miracle after miracle. You read this on page 163. When they fled, the poor remained behind, and these were now looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, I will deliver you or thee, and thou shalt glorify me, for this cause came I into the world. The people pressed into Christ's presence with urgent, pitiful appeals, Master, bless me. He's heard, his ear heard every cry. While with pity exceeding that of a tender mother, he bent over the suffering little ones. All received attention. Everyone was healed of whatever disease he had. The dumb opened their lips in praise. The blind beheld the face of their restorer. The hearts of the sufferers were made glad. And this was the picture which greeted the priests and temple officials as they came back from uh, their flight from the presence of Jesus. And this is the first record that I can find in the life story of Christ where he, be where he began to heal on any kind of, of uh, scale the sick, the needy, the poor, the blind, the halt, the lame and so forth when they at this time came to him there in the temple courts. So what a difference there was between the response of the wicked and the response of the needy at this time. And Nicodemus looking on, of course, was a man who had not shared in the wicked work in the temple. He, he deplored what was going on there and longed to see great changes take place. And because there was in him a spirit desiring better things, he too did not flee at the presence of Jesus Christ, but stood there as a silent observer of the entire drama and was deeply convicted that this was the sent of God who had come to restore righteousness to Israel. At that point, we'll leave the story and pick it up again in our next study period in a few minutes' time, but in, because our time is again gone. Are there any uh, questions you'd like to ask or points you'd like to add to this presentation this afternoon? Well, at the, at the end of that paragraph uh, that starts on 162, it says, And he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, I will deliver thee, mm -hmm. and thou shalt glorify me. For this cause I came into the world. I have not seen that scripture. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Do you know where that is? Um, let me think now. Um, I should. I should. I should. I should. Uh, it's in regard to Jacob, isn't it? Um, where is it again now? Here, if you have a concordance, you can soon find it. 
Uh, and I'm sure one can be found in the house. Well, it, could it be two, two different uh, 50. scriptures? Psalm 50, thank you. 15. Psalm 15. No, 50. 50. I'll be your Psalm 50, verse 15. Okay. <clears throat> yes, this is it, all right. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. So there is the actual scripture, Psalms 50, verse 15. Of course, now three minutes to five, let's uh, plan to come back at five o'clock for our song service, and, uh, well, 15 minutes will be enough. Attend